When it comes time to string together scenes to make levels for a full game, it's not entirely obvious how to do it. I'm Sam from Thousand Ant, and this is my game Zarvat, which I shipped on Nintendo Switch in 2018. I'm going to be making some tutorials here on the Thousand Ant channel about some of the systems I use to create this game. It looks almost ridiculous, but there are almost 200 Unity scene files in Zarvat, and each one is a level, menu, or cutscene. But how in holy Unity do you organize something like this? I had a few systems that made this easy for me to use. Let's take a look. First of all, everything is a scene. Unity is amazing. From the moment you start using it, just pop in a couple of game objects, slap on a couple of components, click play, and there you have it. There's your game. But because Zarvat was a solo project, I had to lean on the engine wherever possible and make sure my tools were efficient for me to use. The concept is really simple. Every level is a scene. Add scenes out of the wazoo. 196 total scenes in the shipped game. What are these scenes? Most of them were levels. Single player levels, multiplayer levels, and cutscene levels. Some of them were even menus. The main menu, the options menu, every menu, the credits, all of those were separate scenes. Everything is a scene. Why, why did I do this? because it made development and iteration very simple for me. Each of the single player levels is a self-contained scene. When designing levels, I can easily set up a player, some enemies, click play, and there I have it, there's a level. All scenes were self-contained. It is very important to keep every scene very self-contained and for it to work when I click play. When building my systems such as the game manager, player, and enemies, I made sure that I could load any level, click play, and have it work properly. This was a key feature that made it possible for me as a solo developer to easily put together levels. Although there is some work up front, once I had a system that allowed me to quickly jump in and out, designing any level, adding cutscenes, additional menus, and more, was architecturally easy. Okay, so now everything is a scene. That's a lot of scenes. Look at my build settings. There's a lot in there, but actually it's kind of nice. It's all ordered, of course. I didn't order them myself by hand. I was only working on Zarbot part-time and I'm, I was tired of dragging and dropping. So I created a sort build settings function that I added to my little menu here. The function is simple. It takes the list of all scenes in the build settings and it orders it by name. Then I just have to make sure my scene names are something recognizable. Whenever I add a new scene to the build settings, I just click on my little menu here and click sort build settings. One of the key features I added to make my scene architecture really sing is what I call the Zarvat level. I added a C-sharp class of type Zarvat level, which contains all the information for a given scene. Think of it like metadata for a scene file. I create a static Zarvat level variable for every scene I add and pipe into it all the data that I need. This can be the actual scene name string or the stylized name to show to the player. I add what music track to play, what background ambient sound effect to play, what type of scene is it, if it's a single player level, a menu, or a multiplayer map, and I can add any new fields as easily as needed. I also made all my Zarvat level variables static read only. This is because this data shouldn't need to change during runtime. 
By making it static, I am able to access any Zarput level from anywhere and check its information. I then made a function that takes the Zarbot level and loads it. This was a really convenient setup for me. I could then easily, for example, set up a on trigger enter to load any level I choose. The Zarbot level loading code will also set the required music, sound effects, or anything else that's needed. During development, this was really convenient. I started creating lots of levels. I wanted to string them together, so I eventually set up a list of Zarbot levels. Because Zarbot is intended as a pretty simple linear game, I could have a list of levels that just lead into one another. Then I created a trigger that would simply load the next level in the list when the player entered it. This also made it really easy to add or subtract or rearrange levels. Finally, I added a really useful feature the reusable scene. Zarbot's story mode follows the adventures of two cubes, charcoal and mustard, as they collect all the parts of a birthday present for their friend Red. And there are some reoccurring stages, such as Red's house, or the subway cutscene, or Charcoal's house. Of course, all of these are scenes, but every time the player re-enters that area, there's different dialogue, there might be different lighting, it's a different level. But is it the same scene? Actually, yes, of course, it's the same scene. Well, at first, I started duplicating each scene. So I would take a finished scene and then duplicate it and then just change some of the interactables. But you can probably guess why that's not such a great idea. What if I needed to change something? Like I wanted to switch out the carpet or I've updated some textures. Then I'd have to change every copy of that scene. One solution was to use Unity's multi-scene feature you can load multiple scenes additively. So I could keep all of the geometry and lighting in one scene, and I could keep all the interactables in a different scene and load them in and out. It's a pretty good feature, and I've used it before in other projects. However, for me, for Zarvat, that was overkill, and it would add way too much complexity for something that I only wanted to swap a few objects out. Another solution is to make all the shared parts, such as geometry and lighting, um, a prefab. That's not a bad solution, but I still didn't want a scene file for every iteration of Red's house, every iteration of the subway, every iteration of the car, and that would just added so many more scene files, complexity, and bloat. Actually, I just wanted to all live in one scene file, so it would stay very simple and if I changed it, it was changed. My solution was pretty simple. I created what I call a reusable scene state, or R state. It's a simple enum. There are R states A, B, C, D, E, F, and then I created child game objects with just the names, you know, A, B, C, D, and so on. One letter for every R state. The script then chooses between which of the R states to use and sets that game object active. Simple, if I have R state A active, then it activates the A game object and disables all the others. If I have C active, then it disables all of the R states except for C, very simple. The last thing I had to do to get this working completely was add the R state manager to the script execution order to allow it to run before any of its children. Now I can easily change the R state, click play, and have a whole different dialogue set up without needing a new scene or a prefab or anything. This also hooks into the Zarbot levels. For each Zarbot level, I tag it with an R state, such as A, B, C, D, or E, and when I load the Zarbot level, I set the R state to the tag letter. Now you can see here I have Zarbot levels that actually point to the same scene file, but I just have them tagged with different R states. So when I load, for example, Subway A, it will load the same scene as Subway B, but it will set the R state to A instead of B. And then when the scene actually loads, it will enable the A objects and not the, any of the other R state objects. This made it really simple for me to create variations on one scene without needing to duplicate the entire scene file. I hope this little tour of the Zarvat 
scene architecture helps you. Of course, this is just the way I did it that helped me as a solo developer get this game out. I'll be doing more videos on how I set up different parts of Zarva, such as how I set up my master singleton and how I avoided common singleton problems, or how I set up my enemy wave design tools and how I created cool menus. If there's anything specific you'd like to see, please leave a comment below. Let me know if there's a specific feature, item, or architecture question you have, and I'd be happy to show how I did it in Zarva. And if you'd like to check out the game, it's available now on Nintendo Switch via the eShop. Thanks for watching.